Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today, taking a look at Alexander the Great and our talk to text quote, When Alexander saw the breadth of his domain, he wept, for there are no more worlds to conquer. I had always thought that was a classical uh, quote from Shakespeare or from uh, someone else that was, uh, you know, really famous but really old, but actually just comes from Hans Gruber, the character in a Die Hard movie. Uh, Hans Gruber played by the same actor as uh, Snape from uh, Harry Potter. But uh, talk to your text on this. Of what do you think is the big idea? And uh, please record that. But Alexander the Great, let's take a look at him. North here in Macedonia uh, was King Philip. And King Philip uh, had actually been raised in Thebes down here in Greece, and he wanted the best education for his son, so he hired Aristotle to be his private tutor. Now, it's noteworthy uh, to say that down here in Greece, they didn't really consider the Macedonians Greek, but Alexander thought of himself as a Greek, and uh, but down here they, they thought the Macedonians were rather like barbarians. And a barbarian is considered an uncivilized people. Now, after the Peloponnesian Wars, that left Athens here and Sparta that we can't see on the map really just too weak to overpower anybody. So King Philip did a pretty good job of coming all the way down here into Thessaly and conquering, or uniting is probably a better way of saying what King Philip did with Greece. Now, in 336 BC, King Philip was assassinated and Alexander was made king at the age of 20. So someone that is assassinated is they are murdered, but it's for political reasons. It's, uh, it's not for other reasons, so it's a special type of murder. Now there is some question on why King Philip was murdered, um, because afterwards Alexander moved really quickly to eliminate all the enemies uh, and unite all of Greece under his rule. So there is some speculation that Alexander himself may have been involved in the assassination. However, after a quick year having that done, Alexander looked east at Persia. Persian Empire was one thing that the Greeks could never handle. They were too big, they were too tough. And Alexander is looking that way, thinking that, eh, they're not too big for me. Now, although Alexander loved his teacher Aristotle, his role model was Achilles. So if you remember, uh, back when we talked about the Trojan War, Achilles was a demigod. He fought in Troy. His mother was Thetis. She was a goddess, but his father was human. Thetis dipped Achilles in the river Styx to make him immortal. However, she held him by his heel. So when she dipped him into the river, the only vulnerable spot of Achilles was his ankle. So Alexander swore that he was going to visit Troy and visit the tomb of Achilles. And he did. So Alexander went into Asia, and then he went on an 11-year tear through the known world. He conquered the Persians, the Egyptians, and the Indus River Valley. So came through here, and one of his big things with the Persians was King Darius, who was the Persian king, fought a couple of battles with him until he eliminated him. But came through here, took over the cities of Tyre and Gaza, and then into Egypt, took them over rather easily, went way out into the desert, came back through, went through Mesopotamia, Babylon, went up into the mountains, uh, and then down into the Indus River, and would have kept going. He would have kept fighting, Except Alexander's army was just about done. They were ready to go home. They had been gone for 11 years. They had conquered the Persians. That's what they came to do. They did more than that. So once they reached in India, his army refused to go on, and they insisted on going back home. So Alexander realized that he could not conquer all the worlds, and he had to turn back. Thus, Hans Gruber's uh, quote that there were no more worlds to conquer. He wanted to go on, he just couldn't.
Alexander the Great of Macedonia really didn't hang around. By the age of 22, he'd conquered virtually the whole of Greece, but he just couldn't stop expanding his empire. Some people are never happy. Are you fed up now you've finished Alexander's Conquest of Greece board game? Why stop there? Keep adding to your empire with the all-new Persia expansion. This new Persia expansion game is awesome! I'm gonna fight an army of one million men. A million? That sounds a bit hard. Yes! Eat my army! I've conquered Persia! Game over! Oh, oh no. Wait a minute, guys. Game's not over yet. That's right, sir. Just when you think you can pack up and go home, you'll be made to play Alexander's new conquest, the Egypt Expansion Board. Are you sure it's just getting late? Yeah, just maybe we should quit while it's still fun. Well, I'm having fun. And it's my game. Yes, fun game. Yay. Oh, look. I've just conquered Egypt. Oh, no. Game over. Uh, <laughs> no. That's right, sir. Alexander's Conquest of Greece, Persia, and Egypt expansion comes with a Conquest of India expansion board, too. Oh, come on. I only really came round to conquer Persia, so... I want to conquer India now. Yeah, that could take a while. I did say I'd pick my sister up from the... From... Oh, look! We've just been attacked by elephants! What is an elephant? Okay, but once we conquer India, then can we go home? Because I got... What do you think? You've guessed it! Alexander's Conquest of Greece, Persia, Egypt and India expansion comes with the To the Ends of the Earth expansion board! We are going to keep playing this game until this board covers the whole world. Guys? Alexander's Conquest of Greece, Persia, Egypt and India with the To the Ends of the Earth expansion board game. Play it until no one will play with you anymore. Right, who is that voice? Alexander's empire was huge and stretched over five million square kilometers, which is massive. Almost as big as Alexander's ego. <laughs> yes, Alexander really was quite a character. So Alexander went everywhere and everywhere he went, he brought the Greek culture with him. Uh, not necessarily on purpose, it just happened. He was great at ripping down things, and behind him, he built several new cities. And because he was building these cities, he named them Alexandria. Um, now, he did, uh, after returning to Babylon from India, uh, Alexander goes for a swim one night and has a great party and catches a fever and dies. Behind him, he left his Greek culture that lived on in Hellenistic kingdoms. There's three huge Hellenistic kingdoms that are left behind Alexander the Great, and three of his generals each became kings of one of them. And a Hellenistic kingdom is a kingdom where Greek history and culture uh, are there after Alexander the Great's death. This is kind of a big deal, guys. This is probably the biggest impact that Alexander the Great had. He brought the thinking of the Greeks to uh, the known world. Everybody started writing in Greek, so there was a common language that you can write back and forth on. Uh, it was very interesting and unifying. And the manner of thinking was just like the Greeks. So, very important, Alexander the Great's conquest even though he's not alone very long. Groovy Greeks! So, oh, what shall we call this new city, O oh Alexander? Hmm? Oh, sorry. O oh Alexander the Great. Yeah. I think we should call it... Alexandria. After our great and powerful leader, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? There he is. Well, you have founded a whole chain of cities from Greece to India. Indeed I have. And you named this one Alexandria. Uh -huh. And you named this one Alexandria, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Then there's Alexandria, yeah. Alexandria, yeah. and further east there's Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's not forget Alexandria. No. Well, that's... That's the thing. I think it might be getting a bit confusing, don't you? Could we perhaps name this new one after someone else? Okay. 
I am the greatest military commander that ever lived. I have conquered the known world and I am barely 26 years old. Perhaps when you found your own city, you can name it after yourself. You could call it, hmm, Skinny Mandria. But since I'm founding them, I'd like to call it Alexandria. Okay. Yes, sir. No, actually, do you know what? Perhaps you're right. Hmm? A great military ruler also listens to his advisers. It is getting a bit confusing. I think we should call it Iskanderun. Iskanderun, great. Hmm. Why Iskanderun? It's Turkish. Is it Turkish for Alexandria? Yes. So clearly, Alexander had a huge ego, ego and uh, named everything after himself. So after he was dead, people were to remember him. Now, the Greek culture continued long after Alexander's death, and the greatest Hellenistic city was Alexandria. It, well, duh, they're all Alexandria. I mean, the Alexandria in Egypt, this one here. The Alexandria in Egypt had one of the seven wonders in the world, the Lighthouse of Alexandria. It was recorded to be 400 feet tall and lasted for centuries. Uh, this is still something that archaeologists are underwater looking for pieces of this tower. They do believe that they found the Lighthouse of Alexandria, um, but uh, not real sure exactly what it looked like. Uh, and this is pretty prominent in uh, some things that happened later in history at the lighthouse. Now, of course, Alexandria in Egypt became the learning capital of the world. It had a library that was the greatest in the world. If you wanted to know something, it was in this library. If we could get into this library today, oh my gosh, the things that we could learn. Unfortunately... About 300 years later, Julius Caesar was in town. He didn't have that many soldiers. He was trying to get things moving, started a fire, and he may have accidentally or on purpose destroyed the library at Alexandria, which is kind of a drag. Uh, the sciences and math would flourish in these Hellenistic kingdoms for centuries to come. Now, the last of our Greek pharaohs were actually, I'm sorry, not Greek pharaohs, the last of the Egyptian pharaohs were actually not Egyptian, they were Macedonians. And um, with Julius Caesar, 300 years later, the last of the pharaohs was Cleopatra. And uh, Cleopatra will end the reign of pharaohs, which was a long reign in Egypt, lasted thousands of years, still the longest lasting civilization on the planet. Nobody's even come close to being as long as uh, Egypt and the pharaohs were around. But the last pharaoh was actually a Macedonian, and that is thanks to Alexander the Great. Now, to sum it all up, I do have a, a crash course video here. I would just send you to the link, except um, I changed some things on it, narrowed it down a little bit, but it's still about 10 minutes long, but that's going to be our video clip for to wrap up this section. Hi there, my name is John Green, this is Crash Course World History, and today we're going to talk about Alexander the Great, but to do that we're going to begin by talking about ideals of masculinity and heroism and Kim Kardashian and the situation. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, Mr. Green! Which situation? Oh, me from the past. I forgot you wanted to go to Columbia. Me from the present regrets to inform you that you do not get in. But since you live in the past, you have no way of knowing who I'm talking about. And it occurs to me that this video may be watched in some glorious future when Kim Kardashian and the situation have mercifully disappeared from public life and the supermarket tabloids, instead of talking about celebrities, talk about Foucault and the Higgs boson particles. They're both known by millions, live in luxury, and people literally pay to own their odors. Why do these people 
people crave fame. Why do any of us? Well, I'd argue it's not about money. If it were, our tabloids would be devoted to the lives and times of bankers. I think we all want to leave a legacy. We want to be remembered. We want to be great. <laughs> great has some misogynistic implications. Like, it's almost always men who are called the great. You never hear of Cleopatra the Great or Elizabeth the Great. Sure, there's Catherine the Great of Russia, but for her mask, anyway, they could have soiled Catherine the Great's name just by telling the truth, which is that like so many other great men and women, she died on the toilet. Get it? Soiled? Toilet? Yes? Yes! So quick biography of Alexander of Macedon, born in 356 BCE, died in 323 BCE at the ripe old age of 32. Alexander was the son of King Philip II, and when just 13 years old, he tamed a horse no one else could ride named Bucephalus, which impressed his father so much that he said, O thy son, look thee out at a kingdom equal to and worthy of thyself. For Macedonia is too little for thee. By that time he was already an accomplished general, but over the next decade he expanded his empire with unprecedented speed and he is famous for having never lost a battle. Today we're going to look at Alexander of Macedon's story by examining three possible definitions of greatness. First, maybe Alexander was great because of his accomplishments. This is an extension of the idea that history is the record of the deeds of great men. Now of course that's ridiculous. For one thing, half of people are women. For another, and this is important, there are lots of historical events that no one can take responsibility for, like, for instance, the Black Plague. Still, Alexander was accomplished. I mean, he conquered a lot of territory. Like, a lot. His father Philip had conquered all of Greece, but Alexander did what the Spartans and the Athenians had failed to do. He destroyed the Persian Empire. He conquered all the land the Persians had held, including Egypt, and then marched toward India, stopping at the Indus River only because his army was like, hey, Alexander, you know what would be awesome? Not marching. Also, Alexander was a really good general, although historians disagree over whether his tactics, no accounts of Alexander were written while he was alive, embellishment was easy. And maybe that's where true greatness lies. I mean, the guy died at 32 before he ever had a chance to get old and lose battles. He was tutored by Aristotle, for God's sakes. Then there's Alexander's single-minded, obsessive, Ahab-esque pursuit of the Persian king Darius, who he chased across modern-day Iraq and Iran for no real reason except that he desperately wanted to kill him. And when Bessus, one of Darius' generals, assassinated him before Alexander had the chance, Alexander chased Bessus around until he could at least kill him. These almost comical pursuits of glory and heroism are accompanied in classical histories by stories of Alexander walking through the desert and it's suddenly raining and these ravens coming to lead him to the army he's supposed to fight. And stories of his hot Persian wife Roxana who, while still a teenager, engineered the assassination of many of Alexander's fellow wives. And even in his death, people tried to make Alexander live up to this heroic ideal. Like, Plutarch tells us that he died of a fever, but that's no way for a masculine, empire-building, awesome person to die. So rumors persist that he died either of alcohol poisoning or else of assassination poisoning. I mean, no great man can die of a fever. Speaking of great men, it's time to strip down for the open letter. So elegant. But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment today. Oh, it's Kim Kardashian's perfume. Thanks, Stan. I'll wear this. I'll check it out. I'll give it a try. <sighs> wow, that is... Mmm. It's like all the worst parts of baby powder and all the worst parts of cat pee. An open letter to the ladies. Hello, ladies. You've really been unfairly neglected in Crash Course World History, and also in world history textbooks everywhere. Like, there will be a whole chapter exploring the exploits of great men, and then at the end there will be one sentence that's like, also, women were doing stuff at the time, and it was important, but we don't really know what it was. So back to Alexander the Great. History has been very good at marginalizing and demeaning women, and we're going to fight against that as we move forward in the story of human civilization. Ladies, I have to go now because my eyes are stinging from the biological weapon known as Kim Kardashian's gold. Seriously, don't wear it. Best wishes. John Green. So in Alexander the Great, we have a story of a man who united the world while riding a magical horse only he could tame across deserts where it magically rained for him so that he could chase down his mortal enemy and then leave in his wake a more enlightened world and a gorgeous, murderous wife. But of course, it's not just Assassin's Creed and Call of Duty that celebrate the idea that ennobled violence can lead to a better world. And that takes us to my opinion of how Alexander really came to be great. Millennia after his death in 1798, Napoleon invaded Egypt not because he particularly needed to invade Egypt, but because he wanted to do what Alexander had done. And long before Napoleon, the Romans really worshipped Alexander, particularly the Roman general Pompey, a.k.a. Pompeius Magnus, a.k.a. 
Pompey the Great. Pompey was so obsessed with Alexander that he literally tried to emulate Alexander's boyishly disheveled hairstyle. In short, Alexander is great because others decided he was great, because they chose to admire and emulate him. Yes, Alexander was a great general. Yes, he conquered a lot of land. The situation is also really good at picking up girls of a certain type. And Kim Kardashian is good at... Dan, what is Kim Kardashian good at? We made Alexander great, just as today we make people great when we admire them and try to emulate them. History has traditionally been in the business of finding and celebrating great men, and only occasionally great women. But this obsession with greatness is troubling to me. It wrongly implies, first, that history is made primarily by men, and secondly, that history is made primarily by celebrated people, which of course makes us all want to be celebrities. Thankfully, we've left behind the idea that the best way to become an icon is to butcher people and conquer a lot of land, but the ideals that we've embraced instead aren't necessarily worth celebrating either. All of which is to say, we decide what to worship and what to care about and what to pay attention to. We decide whether to care about the situation. Alexander couldn't make history in a vacuum, and neither can anyone else. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. So, Alexander the Great, um, you have uh, questions that you can complete on this video, and uh, we will have a friendly competition to see who knows the most about the Greeks in just a couple of days. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.